Welcome to our next episode of the Five Moments of Need Performance Matters series. This is Bob Mosier, one of the many co-hosts you'll meet throughout this series. So friends, are you trying to learn more about the five moments of need? Maybe how to design for them, implement for them, measure them, and even sell them as an approach to your enterprise. Well, in the Performance Matters series, we will help you better understand the theory and best practices behind this powerful methodology and offer proven ways to put the five moments of need into practice. We'd like to welcome you back to our Performance Matters podcast series. This is Con Godfordson, one of your hosts for this series, and today we'll be focusing on a critical leadership matter. We're extremely honored to have with us today Dr. Timothy R. Clark. He's the founder and CEO of Leader Factor. It's a leadership consulting organization. He's a three-time CEO, earned a PhD in social science from Oxford University, and was named an academic All-American football player while he was at BYU. Tim uh, is a good friend, and he possesses, in my experience, an unusual ability to weave theory and real-world experience together in some powerful ways. So welcome, Tim. It's great to have you with us. Thanks, Con. Good to be here. You know, leading change is one of the many areas where you've had deep experience and remarkable insight. And I'm wondering if you'd take a second and share with our listeners a little bit about your experience when it comes to leading change. I guess the way that I would say, Con, is that I, I kind of look at leading change as a gateway competency because in the 21st century, it's so dynamic that I just don't know a leader that is being paid to maintain the status quo. I, I don't know that I've <laughs> met one. <laughs> I just don't. Yeah. So we're, what are we being paid for? We're being paid to maintain competitive advantage in a highly dynamic, unforgiving, hyper-competitive environment. And so what does that mean? By definition, it means that you are going to be leading change. And so if you can do that, then you got a chance. If you can't do that, I, I don't know how you survive. So it's really that important. It's that critical. It's kind of a threshold requirement to be successful in the current environment. That makes uh, great sense. So, Tim, if you could choose any one quality that a leader needs in order to successfully navigate change in their organization, what would that be? I'm going to I think I'll surprise you a little bit, Con, in my answer. And this is really the subject of my latest research in my forthcoming book. I'm going to say the ability to create psychological safety. And the reason that I say that is because here's what I've learned over time. If you go into an organization and you see evidence of fear, that's the first sign of weak leadership. You have to think about that for a minute. It's really evidence. It's symptomatic yeah. of weak leadership. And not only that, it's the thing that really shuts people down. It's the thing that neutralizes their performance and really stifles creativity and innovation. The leader has to be able to draw out people, draw out their motivation and their capacity. And if he or she can do that, then now we have a chance to do some special things. So I think that regardless of the industry you're in, regardless of what your technical skills may be, and regardless of what the source of your competitive advantage may be, you have to be the architect of the culture. You set the tone and the vibe and the working environment and that becomes the great enabler of collaboration. Because here's the way that I look at it. In any organization, you only have two processes going on. You've got execution, which is the creation of value today. And you've got innovation, which is the creation of value tomorrow. That's all we do. We, we just do those two processes. Well, if you step back and look at those two processes, those two processes are primarily social processes. They are both reliant upon rich, high quality collaboration. Well, what do you need for that? You need psychological safety. 
So it's it's really that important. And I would cite that. It may be a surprise to some, but I'm going to go with that, Con. So when you say psychological safety, what does that look like in an organization? I, I know you've touched on that just a little bit, but just help me understand a little bit more what you mean by psychological safety. Sure. So if you look at the research literature in this area, most people say, well, psychological safety means that you have to be able to have a voice. You have to be able to, to have a say. Let, let me give you a, a much more concrete definition of psychological safety. I think it means four things. Number one, it means that you feel included. That's number one. So that's the minimum requirement to feel included. Number two, it means that you feel safe enough to learn, to ask questions, give and receive feedback, even make mistakes. That's the second stage to be able to learn. Third, it means to be able to contribute to the team or the organization, to contribute to their purpose and contribute to the value creation process as a full-fledged member of the team. So that's the third stage. And then fourth, I think it means feeling safe to be able to challenge the status quo. That's the culminating stage. That's the ultimate stage. Now, all of those things you have to feel that you can do without what? Without being embarrassed, without being marginalized, without being punished in some way. Yeah. With, without that fear. So that you have to drain the organization of the fear of doing those four things. As I look at it and as I study that, the way this works, there's a pattern and there's a kind of a progression where you've got to feel included first before you can learn, right? And then you've yeah. got to learn before you can contribute as a full-fledged member of the team. And then you have to have that ability to contribute before you can actually go to the organization and challenge status quo. So I think there's a natural progression there. Sure. And I can certainly see how that then influences a group, a team's or ability to navigate change, right? Yeah. To bring about change in an organization, you've got to have that. So that makes sense. So what are the key challenges that a team faces when approaching a change initiative? There can often be many, but let me cite one that I think is universally a challenge that we see over and over again as we're working with organizations. And that is that the leaders who are charged to lead the, the change initiative, whatever it is, they're naive to the disruption that they are going to cause. They just don't understand it. They don't understand the breadth and depth of that disruption. <laughs> they know it's going to cause disruption. They know that they're knocking the organization out of its orbit, but they don't understand really the full scope of what they're doing. And so because they don't understand that, and because they haven't really done really high quality analysis to understand not only the magnitude of the, of the disruption, but where it's going to occur and what kind of disruption will occur, they don't count the cost and they're not prepared. And so the chronic pattern that we see over and over again that creates false starts, right? Look around at organizations across the board and what do you see? You see organizations that are littered with the failed remains of change initiatives that didn't quite work out. Now you go look at those change initiatives and you realize they weren't, most of them were not flawed. They were good. They failed on execution because they didn't understand what they were really getting into and they were not prepared for it. So they just went headlong into the initiative and they said, we're going to do this. And they were woefully unprepared for the disruption that they were going to cause. So what I would say, so what do you do? You've got to go in and you've got to do what we call a disruption analysis. You've got to think very clearly and carefully through different categories of disruption about what this proposed change initiative will cause in the organization as it moves through the organization on several levels. And we don't need to get into all the details, but that is an area it is a challenge that we see over and over again, going in, 
unprepared, not understanding the extent of the disruption and not being prepared for that. And so what happens? It's a false start. So that's very interesting. And any other challenges? Let me give you a lens to think about this and and all the listeners. So I want you to think about just any change initiative that you may be working on. And I want you to think about the way that change initiative sinks into the organization. Change means that you're taking an organization that's in a state of equilibrium or relative equilibrium, and you're disrupting it. So it goes into a state of disequilibrium, and then you're gonna try to get it back to equilibrium, but in a new state, better after the change. Well, think about how change settles into that organization. Here's how it happens. So it goes through three phases. The first phase is the technical phase. So what that means is we put all of the non-human aspects of change in place. So what do I mean by that? I mean tools and technology. I mean structure and systems. I mean processes and procedures. All of those things We put those in place. That's the first phase. That's the technical phase. Now, what's so interesting, Con, and you've seen this, organizations will often have a major change initiative. They'll do the technical phase, and then they'll say, hey, that was great. We're done. Let's move on. (laughs) Right? Right? Yeah. We got to move on. We've got the next initiative. They're not remotely done. That's phase one. So the technical phase is phase one. Phase two is the behavioral phase. In the behavioral phase, what are people doing? They are now acting and behaving differently. And they're interacting with the technical changes that you put in place. Could be technology, could be a new role, could be a new procedure, could be a new process, could be a new structure or system. They're behaving and acting differently in concert with those technical changes. So that's the behavioral phase. It's at that phase that we start to see better results often. Now, typically, we'll see a loss in performance initially, and then we'll come out of that, right, that S-curve. We'll come out of that, and we'll start to climb, and pretty soon we will elevate our performance, and we'll be doing better than we were before. So why is that happening? Because people are behaving differently, and they have different tools with which to do it or processes or whatever. So they're doing better. That's the second phase, the behavioral phase. Again, now here's the great temptation here. In the second behavioral phase, when you literally are performing better than you were, you look around and by all indications, you say, hey, I think we're done. Look, we're doing better than we were. There's clear evidence that we're doing better than we were, then we are done, so let's move on. The deception is that that change is very fragile. And if you take your hands off the wheel too soon, then you will snap back. You will regress to the mean, and you will lose all of your gains. So what are they missing? They're missing the third phase. The third phase is the cultural phase. So think about it. We've gone technical phase. And then we go behavioral phase, and now we go cultural phase. What's the cultural phase? The cultural phase means that we habituate the behavior by anchoring it with new values, new assumptions, that we sink into the cultural soil of the organization, and now it sticks. So this is how we get a change to stick, because it's rooted in the culture. When that happens, we develop now new grooved thinking. We were able to calcify that change. Now, that, all, that can become the enemy when we have to change again, but that's how organizations behave. So the point is that you can't sustain your gains until you've moved safely from technical to behavioral to finally the cultural phase. And so often... We take our hands off the wheel too soon for various reasons. We're bored. We're busy. We fell out of love with the initiative. Who knows all of the different reasons that we move on to the next thing. But we didn't finish the job. 
we didn't go the distance. We took our hands off the wheel too soon, as I said, and, and that is what we call late stage failure. Does that make sense? Oh, it sure does. So tell me, as I move through each of those phases, any guidance that you want to give uh, our listeners to, uh, to succeed? Sure. So I'll lay out a, a framework that might help the listeners as you are assessing a, an, a change initiative. So we use, we use a four-stage process that we call the EPIC stages. And EPIC is an acronym. So let me, let me just talk about each stage. Stage one is evaluation. So it's in stage one that you evaluate the rationale for change and the feasibility for change and everything about it. So let, let's just talk about rationale. Change can only be justified if it's connected to one or a combination of three things. So number one, it has to increase value. Or number two, it has to decrease cost. Or number three, in some way, it has to provide for the requirements of security and or compliance. And what we mean like regulatory compliance or security. So change, if you think about it, Change is always connected to one or a combination of those three factors. Value, so increase value. Cost, number two, we're going to decrease cost. Or perhaps security and compliance in some way. Mm. Now, every change isn't necessarily, doesn't have all three drivers, but it has to have at least one as the basic rationale for doing it. So that's one of the things that we do is that's clarifying the case for change, that rationale, which we do in stage one evaluation. And that, that has to be crystal clear. Um, and, is, and it's during that phase also then you talked about evaluating the nature of the disruption. That's right. That you're going to have, that that all takes place in that first phase. That all takes place in that first stage. That's where we evaluate the nature of the disruption because we're we're getting ready to move the organization out of its state of equilibrium, we've got to be ready to go. So change management as a as an applied discipline really is a front end loaded process. We have to we do our most important work up front, otherwise the risk becomes extremely high. And that's why mortality rates for large scale change initiatives is seventy percent plus, right? So that's stage one. And there, there are other tools and diagnostics that we use for stage one. I think the thing to understand, Con, is that we understand where the quicksand is. We understand where the failure patterns are and where people make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And in stage one, they're, they're not attending to these basic requirements before you launch. So stage two, what's a challenge uh, we will meet and that we need to address? Sure. So in stage two, stage two is preparation. So stage one was evaluation. Stage two is preparation. So we're getting ready to launch. So in stage two, I think one big challenge that we see over and over again is that we did not build a coalition. Now think about that. So what's a coalition? A coalition is a group of individuals and stakeholders that support us and can help us. Yeah. So think about the risk of not having a coalition. You launch into a change initiative. You basically have an unfunded mandate. Mm -hmm. You're going for, but, and I mean, you're, you're unfunded with, with the support that you need. Right. So think about what a coalition can do. A coalition can do two things better than you can as a leader. Number one, gather information. Number two, influence people. So a coalition makes you as a leader scalable. It scales influence and it scales information gathering. Those are two things that you have to do in successful change. Your coalition becomes your scalable resource. It becomes your arms and legs and allows you 
to do what you otherwise had no possibility of doing. Now, your coalition isn't going to be complete before you launch your change initiative, but at least you need at least the beginnings of a coalition, and then you can go from there. But you can see that people, they again, they go headlong into the initiative without a coalition, and they get in trouble really, really fast. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. What about uh, implementation? What challenge there do we need to be aware of? So implementation, I think there are several things, but one that I might cite that I think is is at the top of the list would be trying to accelerate from the very beginning. So the beginning of this third stage of implementation is the launch. That's the transition event that takes you to stage three implementation. And your goal is to generate early momentum so that you're getting more people on board and you're helping people overcome the the sources of their resistance, whether they are intellectual or emotional. And so what do you do? You put in place a set of what we call accelerators, little things that can give you early wins in the first few days, because people are going to look around as soon as you launch, people are going to look around and say, hey, uh, what's going on? Uh, Should I get on board? A lot of people are not, they're not solidly on board. They're still doing a cost kind of risk reward calculation in their own head. So they're looking around to see if there's any evidence that this is going to be successful. And so it's kind of a race against the clock. As soon as you launch You want to do little things that create early wins, generate early momentum to help the entire process. If you launch and there's a lull right after launch, if there are indications that you're stalling, it's the worst possible thing. Yeah, I've been there. You've been there. (laughs) And as you know, as you know, Con, a lot of change initiatives, they're big and they're long and they take a while. And so the logic behind accelerators is that you provide renewed energy into the process. You know it's going to be a long journey. You know it's going to be a long, hard slog. But you've got to get from point to point. And as you create those wins, that's a renewal process. That allows you to inject new energy and momentum into the process. And it keeps that momentum going. And people have this sense of forward motion and progress, even though we know the journey is going to take some time. And of course, the the sea of epic culture. So the fourth stage, this is the last stage. So what have we been through? We've been through evaluation, stage one. We've been through preparation, stage two. We've been through implementation, which is stage three. And now we get to the last stage, which is consolidation. So that's the C in the epic. Now, what does consolidate mean? Consolidate means, the word literally means to bring together and to make solid. That's exactly what we're trying to do with change. We're trying to bring it together and we're trying to make it stick. And so this goes back to the kind of the vertical phases that I talked about where you go technical, behavioral, cultural. In order to consolidate the change, You've got to stay with it until you get it into at least the first part of the culture of the organization so that it has some some anchoring. Now, it's going to take time before it fully consolidates, but you've got to stay with it long enough to get through the technical phase and the behavioral phase. And so one of the questions that people often ask is, so how do you know if you're getting to that, that cultural phase? How do you know? And it's a really good question because you can't really see it often You because people are behaving differently and you may be performing better, but you don't know for sure. So here's what I would say. You pay attention to the conversations that people are having in the organization and you can tell just through the dialogue if those conversations are supporting the change or if they're lamenting the change and wanting to go back. So 
listen to the questions people ask. Listen to the statements they make. They may say something like, yeah, it, it, and it's it's pretty rewarding when you hear some of these things. So how, do, how did we used to do that? Or they'll, or they'll make a suggestion that builds on the change, that doesn't try to go back. And so these are cultural indicators that the change is moving to that level. So we have to monitor that dialogue. The organization reveals itself in its dialogue. And you can tell when you're starting to anchor into the culture. You know, Tim, for a long time, I've been working with organizations and their whole change approach has been to just have a communication strategy. You know, that's how Mm -hmm. we go about it. Clearly, there's so much more to it. If you really want to have change work to navigate that journey of change. Anything else that you want to share with our listeners before we close today? Well, to that point, Con, maybe build on that a little bit. What's funny and and ironic about change is that people resist what they agree with. Now, you got to think about that for a minute. When it comes to change, people resist what they agree with, what they think makes sense from a logical, rational, intellectual, strategic standpoint, you can get them to agree with the course of action that you're going to take or you are taking. And they'll say, yeah, it makes sense. I think we should do that. That's the logical thing, that this change makes sense in so many ways. And you can you can go through the analysis, you can go through the rationale, and they're going to nod their heads and they're going to say, yeah, I agree, I agree, I agree. And yet they will resist what they are agreeing with. Why is that? Because the intellectual process, they're processing it on an intellectual level, but they're also processing it on on an emotional level. It is disruptive to them. And so think about the the ways that the change is disruptive. It's, It's disruptive in so many ways. Socially, it's disruptive. Economically, it's disruptive. Politically, it's disruptive. Geographically, it's disruptive. It's disruptive in every way. And so even though we agree with it, we often can resist what we agree with. Having a communication strategy for change is fantastic, but there's a lot more to it because there are three units of analysis when it comes to change. There's the, there's the organization, which we understand, but then there's the team. The team is the basic unit of performance in every organization, and then there's the individual. And so the change leader in the 21st century has got to become competent, perceptive and competent at all three levels to help people move forward, the individual level, the team level, and the organizational level. And when you really think about the nature of resistance, it really helps us understand how important this is. At an organizational level, it's a systems level thing. It's, it's a systems level phenomenon. But as we move down, it's a deeply human phenomenon as well. And so as a change leader, you're a strategist, but guess what? You're also a grief counselor and a triage <laughs> nurse. So yeah. these are the roles that we play as change leader. We're strategists, but we're also grief counselor and triage nurse. That just shows you how complex this can be. Yeah. Well, Tim, thank you so much for sharing your insights and remarkable experience. I hope we can have uh, some additional discussion as we move forward. But for now, we hope you found today's discussion helpful. And as always, please let us know how we can help. We look forward to all that lies ahead. Uh, This is Con Godfordson and Dr. Timothy R. Clark, founder and CEO of Leader Factor. Thanks, Tim, for being with us today. Thank you, Con. Appreciate the opportunity. Well, that's it for this episode of the 5 Moments of Need Performance Matters series. We look forward to future conversations around how to best put the 5 Moments of Need into practice. We welcome your feedback and can be reached on Twitter using my Twitter handle at BMOSH as well as our Five Moments of Need website, which is www.thenumber5momentsofneed.com. 
We hope you're finding these helpful and will subscribe to future episodes. Have a great day, friends.